Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. It is 12 o'clock, so it is time for our What's New at One Schoolhouse this week. Um, I'm Sarah Hanawald. I'm the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development and New Programs at One Schoolhouse. And I have two Elizabeths with me today. So I have, um, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm being a little bit familiar. Liz, you're Liz. And then Elizabeth, you're Elizabeth Allen. And so Liz, many of you have seen before on our webinars joining us. She's our Assistant Head of School for School engagement. And Elizabeth Allen is associated with one schoolhouse and one of our consortium schools as an amazing Spanish educator. And we're going to dive into that in just a minute. I'm going to give you a little bit of my uh, what's going on at one schoolhouse as we welcome the last few folks into the webinar. So on our blog right now, we have a blog post written by Liz and Elizabeth together called Interaction is Everything about our language. And then next week's webinar is going to be the next normal enrollment. And Heather Hurl will be joining us from the Enrollment Management Association to talk about trends and what academic leaders can learn from, from what they're seeing at the Enrollment Management Association. We have an opportunity. And actually, Liz, since you're here with me, do you mind sharing a little bit about this opportunity before we get going? Sure. So, um, you know, from talking to many of the schools in our consortium, which now is about 240, um, we're hearing that a lot of them have a very small number of students who can't return to campus. Um, and that also that there are families who may be uh, requesting increased flexibility in scheduling. So uh, in response to that need, we have expanded our course catalog to include more courses that are typically required for graduation. Um, what that means is that um, it is possible for the first time for a student to take um, a full or a significantly partial um, course load with one schoolhouse for, um, for the academic year and for our consortium schools. Um, there's also the possibility of a single semester enrollment. So uh, if you're interested or if you your school is struggling with the same problem, we're encouraging schools to think about this as an alternative to uh, persisting with concurrent or dual or hybrid instruction, meaning student at home and some students in the classroom. Um, so if, if that sounds like a problem that folks in your community are trying to tease out, um, we hope you'll give us a call. Great, thank you so much. Um, those courses include, sorry, I didn't switch to this slide earlier. So those are some of the courses that are involved. So if you're watching this in the recording, you can hit pause and take a good look. <laughs> Otherwise, they're on our website. And then we also have on our website our advanced independent curriculum. So this is the, the program that we have introduced and are talking about for thinking about what we're going towards when we want a more mission aligned, advanced, rigorous curriculum. And we've got standards and principles and professional learning for that on our website. And then summer professional learning. This is something that Elizabeth and I were just talking about before we began because she was involved as a teacher leader in our summer PD last year. And we're excited to offer this year a little bit of a different approach to think about how do we find the things that we wanna keep from this year. How do we address the things that were a real challenge and that we need to restore equanimity as we approach next year and thinking about what our students will need from us. And last week, if you didn't catch her, Leslie Fry talked about the importance yeah. of taking the time to figure out how you can be the teacher that you need to be because she says you cannot pour from an empty cup. So I highly recommend that on our website. We also have some other courses, Building Trust is back again. And I invite you to go to the professional development page on our website and take a look and see what's there for you. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And I just wanna say, Elizabeth, I wanna thank you again. We're gonna use everyone the chat for sharing resources. I'm gonna put Elizabeth's blog entry in there and we're gonna use the Q&A for questions. And I'm sure we're gonna get some great questions here. But I just wanna publicly thank you again, Elizabeth, for last summer being part of helping teachers move their courses online sort of rapidly and with a lot of confusion and dismay about what the start of school might look like, what the middle of school might look like. So thank you so much for being a part of that. Do you mind just saying hello and introducing yourself a little bit? Hi, 
I'm Elizabeth Allen, and I've been teaching at the Harper Hall School in Nashville for 20 years. I've been involved in one way or another at one schoolhouse for about 11, I think, really. Yeah. It's the very first um, blended learning course. I was a student in that. Um, and um, now I, I was the foreign, I was the World Language Department Chair here for many years. I've actually moved into a role as our director of our Global Scholars Program, and I still teach Spanish, three sections of Spanish. So. I have my foot in a, I have two feet in different parts of the school now, but um, I really, I really enjoyed this summer in particular it was a great learning experience for me as well. Um, because there are a lot of talented language teachers in our schools and all they really needed was a little push to get themselves started on this journey. All right, well, I will add my welcome to Sarah's. Um, I've been lucky enough to be a colleague of Elizabeth's for four years um, here at one schoolhouse. Um, and um, I can tell you as a colleague, she is a delight to work with. Um, so I wanted to get started, um, Elizabeth. Um, one of the things um, that really struck me in your blog post um, was your observation that conversation in itself is not a skill, but a practice. Um, but we also all know that that conversation, the target language is a key is a key element of in person classes. So can you start out by talking about sort of the distinction that you make between practice and skill and um, and then the alternative practices that you use to develop the same skills in the online space? And it's a really big question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, well, to start with, I don't want to devalue that in-person conversation piece in a synchronous face-to-face -face classroom. And, and the truth is that can be replicated online in a synchronous learning environment. And the challenge at One School House is that we have an asynchronous learning environment, which for goes, um, I, you know, at different times in my years teaching language at One School House, I've tried assigning students to have synchronous conversations and you know, their schedules really don't align a lot of the time and they're very busy yeah. kids. So um, that became difficult. And so I, I had to step back, not just for the purpose of learning a language, but also for the purpose of having the kinds of discussions that I really value in the literature classroom um, and think about what am I trying to do here with those discussions. Um, and that led me to break it down into some constituent parts. Um, there's demonstrating understanding in general um, of whatever, for example, in literature, whatever work or text that we're dealing with, and also being able to articulate questions about those things. And all of that can be achieved in writing or in something, you know, a lot of people use Flipgrid. Um, and in Canvas, I tend to just use the video option for discussions, but um, that can be done asynchronously. Uh, and it also forces students to really think about what they want to say. Uh, they prepare a little more. So while you lose the spontaneous, aha, I just thought of this, a lot of times they are able to more fully articulate a spontaneous idea within that discussion board or within that asynchronous conversation. Um, We've been talking a lot in our national, in ACTL, our national um, organization about interpretive, uh, interpretive mode, which is reading and listening. And um, active listening is something that we're just really starting to focus on in the language classroom. I've attended some great workshops at ACTL and other places about that. Um, and it, it, it's an important skill that we can teach through the spontaneous conversation in class, but we can teach that skill asynchronously and ask them to apply it in the real world in a different way. Um, for example, I can give them an asynchronous conversation to practice about a specific topic, and then I can ask them to go and find someone in the real world to talk to in Spanish about that and come back and report to me. And if they don't know someone, then they, I can set them up with me or a student in the, or a student in the class. And that, that kind of meets all of those needs in, in a, a very elegant way. That's, that's great. Um, 
I love I also I love the real world engagement of that piece too. the 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 understanding that those skills have application beyond the classroom walls and you know and having that be not something that's reserved for when you reach mastery level, but it's really part of building skills too. I, I just I think that that prep that that experience is so valuable. Um, so when you're teaching online with one schoolhouse, and as you mentioned, our courses are asynchronous, but they're also paced. So everybody's working on the same content at the same time. Um, you can have students from more than a dozen schools. Um, in fact, usually you have students from more than a dozen schools. Um, and they've all had slightly different preparation for your course too. Um, so knowing that you're likely to have a range and that, you know, any that, well, the broad that they broadly overlap, but that you're likely to find, um, you know, that they all have their own spaces for growth, which to be honest, isn't that different from a real, from a regular classroom, even if yeah. they've all come from the same class the previous year. Um, but knowing that you're likely to have that range, how do you plan a course that allows for differentiation? Um, at the same time in AP Spanish literature that you're preparing them all for the same cumulative, summative, standardized exam. So one of the things I've learned teaching at one schoolhouse is that they need options in pretty much every area of their learning. So there are options for um, receiving information and options for processing information and options for presenting information in a formal way. Um, so the simplest answer to that is you can read this, you can watch this, you can listen to this and take notes. You can produce a formal essay. You can produce a, an oral presentation that organizes all the information. You get to choose um, what skill you need to practice at that time. Usually the kids choose well. Um, in, especially in that AP class, they they know, oh, I'm having a hard time remembering all of these um, literary devices. And she's given me an option to develop something around that. And I don't really need to practice writing an essay right now. So I'm going to make a presentation for her about literary devices. Um, so that is one way that you can differentiate. And you can always add to your previously prepared class, further options. There's never, I mean, there's no, or you can change options. If, for example, this year I have a lot, a lot of heritage learners, which means students who um, speak Spanish at home to varying degrees with their Spanish speaking families. Um, but some of them have more developed reading and writing skills than others. And then my second language students, students coming in and this is their target language. Um, a lot of them actually have more advanced formal writing skills than the kids who speak Spanish at home. So we have a lot of stuff going on every week in terms of, can I read this work? Some girls, for example, who speak Spanish at home can't really read. Um, they didn't learn to read in Spanish growing up, and so they panic when they see the text. So having an audio version, my first thing is always, you need to listen while you read. And eventually it will get easier and all of them do report that it does. Um, but making that oral connection first is how they can manage Lazarillo de Tormes from the Renaissance period. Mm -hmm. um, so there are all these different pieces. The thing is that you have to get to know the student in order to know which way you need to nudge the student. Mm -hmm. um, and that really comes from having conversations with them. And I really only have three or four conversations face-to-face, -face, one on one regularly each year. But it comes at a time when I'm able to go, hey, how are things going for you? And then they can always come and meet with me if they want. Most of the time, the AP students are so caught up in their reading and writing and working that they don't, they don't spend a lot of time coming to me face-to-face -face on a Zoom with questions. But so there's all of that that goes into developing different options to help them differentiate and them identify their learning. And the so, goal setting functions as well at one schoolhouse help with that because they they do have to think deeply about what they need to do. 
Um, is there a difference in how you use differentiation in between your face to face classroom and your online classroom or in how you see students accessing it? Well, um, it's interesting. I probably used less differentiation in my face to face classroom until I started teaching online. And this kind of blends in with our other with our other ideas. Um, teaching online made me realize that I needed to offer more options to my face to face students. And so I've begun to do that. And some of that is transferred back and forth. One of the interesting pieces to me, a challenge online is collaboration. Um, and a couple of years ago, that became a goal of mine in my online class. And the simplest solution turned out to be the most elegant solution in that case. I had them create uh, review sheets for each work and they had to collaborate on them in groups. And they have to alternate which kind of, maybe one week you get to talk about the context of the work, but the next week you have to analyze literary devices. And another week you get the easy part where you get to summarize. Um, interestingly, I started doing that with my face-to-face -face class last year, even though we have lots of opportunities for collaboration. Right now they're collaborating on presenting a work um, in pairs. Each pair is presenting a text in its class. Um, they love these review sheets in both classes. This is the thing they think is most helpful to them in preparing for the exam. And it's probably the most consistent collaboration that we do. So every time I develop something in my face-to-face -face class that really works, I think a lot about what worked and why and how I could translate it online. And then on the flip side, it really helps me on, when I'm teaching online because I think so far in advance, I can't, I can't be spontaneous in the same way. So I come up with ideas that I really work out in the online class and then I go, hey, how can I make that work in, in the face-to-face -face classroom? And usually the translation in each place goes really well. So what I hear you saying is that is that the um, the skills that you that you work on in both environments really cross-pollinate the other, that yeah. that having the chance to do both at the same time makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you mentioned uh, one point we talked that you teach, you've taught AP Spanish at one schoolhouse at the same time that you were teaching it um, at Harpeth Hall. So I'm just curious, um, how does the student experience differ in those two environments? You know, because we sort of, it's a great apples to apples experience um, for us to say, because I know in my role managing school partnerships, I, I it's not uncommon for me to have a school say, well, but they really can't get through the same stuff on online, can they? Um, and and I can say from knowing you, yeah, actually they they really do. But I'm curious about what's different and what that what you've learned from those differences. Um, I would say a primary difference is that my online class is more efficient. Um, we use time more efficiently. I know what's going on with the kids because they write to me individually and say, you know, I'm having meltdown. I'm not going to finish the work this week. And I say, okay, let's talk about what we can do. Um, if I'm in a face to face classroom, especially teaching all girls, that meltdown tends to become um, a, a classroom stopper. <laughs> so um, I will say that. There is a there's a real peace in knowing that I can address individual student issues outside of the space of our class online and still address them. Um, whereas in the face to face classroom, the you know, the other thing about face to face language classrooms that I, I think are a little bit different from some of the other disciplines is that by the time you're taking AP Spanish or AP French or AP Chinese, you've probably been in the same language class for three or four years. And you know each other really well. And those are little odd communities, um, almost family-like by the end. And so in the face-to-face -face classroom, that part can take precedence sometimes over the actual Spanish literature piece. And it should. Um, nevertheless, it can slow me down <laughs> and slow their role, um, honestly. So that's an interesting sort of difference for me uh, because I'm always a little behind in that face-to-face class. Sure, so um, we've got, 
Oh, sorry. I, I no, did not ahead. mean to cut you off. Um, so we've, you. that's okay. We've got a few questions that are popping up um, here. And um, Elizabeth, I, I just wanted um, to, to, uh, to focus in on that idea that being an online teacher helped you be more planful um, uh, in your in-person yeah. classes. Um, and could you just talk about that for a moment and maybe give um, a, a couple of specific examples that could be a takeaway for, um, for a teacher who's in-person only? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I planned the whole course before it ever begins. And that has allowed, I have started doing that for my face-to-face -face course as well. It doesn't mean I don't change it. That it does not mean that there are not changes in that in that rhythm um, in the face-to-face -face course more often than in the online course. But it does mean that I feel like I have the space to make those changes um, with alacrity. I can do it quickly. It also um, gives me that sense of freedom to go, hey, this could fit really nicely right here in my face-to-face -face class. And oh, next year I'm gonna include it in my online class as well. Um, right now, for example, I'm not liking the rhythm we've had this year in either course in terms of, I think, I think it's an organizational issue and I wanna change the order in which I do some of the thematic work. Um, so I've practiced that a little bit in my face-to-face -face classroom and I'm going to put that on because I had the opportunity to make that shift very quickly. And I'm going to I'm going to try that with the online class this year. Um, another way, okay. So I want to go back to when I was teaching the summer two to three transition course because I did see a question pop up about students in earlier years, and it is a challenge. Right. Um, and yet you can do it really, really well. Um, back when we were teaching the summer transition course, the two to three course had two kinds of students in it. They had students who were doing remedial work so that they could get through Spanish three next year. And I had students who wanted to do advanced work. And so they were coming in hoping to get ahead. So um, I built the course with another teacher and we built it primarily for the remedial, thinking that would be the primary group of students. So right away, we had to start thinking about how we could rebuild the course while we were teaching it. Um, and then that, is when I started really thinking about why I do what I do in my classroom. Um, and going back to that moment, it was a realization that um, less is more. So I, if I want them to do memory work, for example, we've talked about this this summer anyway in this year um, in terms of assessment. We Anything that's Googleable and it's online, we, we really can't do. So how are we gonna have them do memory work. That sent me on a path of thinking about lower level language and comprehensible input. And language teachers will know what I'm talking about when I say that. And um, so at lower levels, finding comprehensible input and stag and scaffolding their learning um, is a way to help them make those passages to where you want them to be. Um, that may sound really obvious when I say it now, but when I was in the throes of language teaching, and especially when I was highly focused on grammar, and now I'm more focused on proficiency, um, which is typical in our in our current mode of language learning, um, just the idea that I could give up some of that very directed memory work and put it toward having them use the language they know uh, became really important. Um, does that make sense? You know, Absolutely. Um, yes, even even to a non-language teacher. <laughs> it's still, I'm going to drop a couple of links in the chat too. Yeah, um, it's still not going to get you that moment to moment. You're in the classroom. I, I think what teachers rely on are our instincts in the classroom in, in terms of, oh, she got that. She understood or he didn't. Um, you're still going to struggle with yourself right, about that, because language teachers have this idea that um, they need to be talking in the target language every single day, which they do. Um, that would be great <laughs> in order to really become confident and comfortable and proficient in the language. The thing is, we just don't recognize all those little bitty steps in that conversation. I built these questions so that I would have them sit together 
and talk about this topic and hopefully extrapolate when they're in a, in a higher level language, um, hopefully extrapolate a little and be spontaneous. That is harder to achieve in an asynchronous environment. But if I'm thinking about those steps, I can still do it. It's just, it's not gonna feel as instinctive to me as a teacher, especially after 20 some odd years in a language classroom. Elizabeth, I think what, one of the things that I heard you say is that in fact, being um, intentional and planning out the course well in advance actually lets you be more responsive and um, at times more fluid because you don't have the anxiety about how you're gonna get to the end. You know, ex you can look at that and say, I can add this, I can take away that, I can change this. Um, and so, you know, I think as, as teachers that, and you know, I, I start out in the classroom too, um, as teachers, we sort of assume that we have to go in like an open book if we're gonna be responsive to our students. And I love the way that you're pointing out that that's a myth um, and that, that there are lots and lots of different ways to be able to respond to your students and to have a student-driven classroom without giving up the kind of planning, intentionality, and scaffolding that really helps students to grow as learners. Yeah, it's true. And as I tell you what I really admired, and, and I'm going to harken back to this summer, what I really admired as I was working with the different language departments, principal and departments this summer, were how many of my colleagues in the languages are basically writing their mission statement and setting their, their departmental outcomes up there on high and then discussing on a, on, a, on a vertical and horizontal level what that looks like. Um, and I applaud that. And I think that's the way to get to this point. And honestly, it, it makes hybrid learning easier um, for a language teacher if we already have those outcomes in mind. And it's easier to let go of content if we have those outcomes in mind. So this year, for example, in Spanish 2, in my face-to-face -face classroom, we are not doing a lot of the stuff we would have normally done in terms of we need to know about relative pronouns. We need to know. And I, I mean, we've pared it down to we need to be able to communicate in these ways. How are we going to get them to do that? And every teacher is doing it differently. There's three of us. And we all have different different approaches but i really talking to the girls i think at the end we're going to be there and that is entirely achievable in an asynchronous environment it just requires a lot of thinking about each step so we've got another question that really i think stems from what you just said about being super intentional and it's about formative feedback those comprehension checks where you interact with the student to help them understand what they understand and know what they need to know next. And so the question is, um, it's got several aspects to it, but I think part of that is how do you give feedback that changes student practice and what they know? And then part of that is in that process, are there guidelines or timelines for how to give that feedback that you follow? Well. I would love to say that I, I abide by all my timelines, but um, the truth is that some, some weeks I can give feedback immediately and sometimes I'm a little slower. Um, best case scenario, it depends on what I want them to know and what kind of feedback I'm giving. If it's a, if it's a discrete point kind of thing, um, if we're talking about vocabulary or um, use of grammar, our online materials for most language classes already contain a lot of um, immediate, I mean, activities that allow us to give that formative feedback immediately through those platforms, or we can build them into our own mess. So I might build a formative quiz on um, different uses of the subjunctive that literally is fill in the blank or, or, um, or multiple choice or whatever I needed to be. Am I, am I looking for their comprehension skill? Do I want to see if they can produce this form and it takes a lot of time to build that formative quiz mm -hmm. but they can take it 10 times and if they take it 10 times then they've interacted with it 10 times and if they've interacted so they with it 10 times, <laughs> they're gonna know it better 
And that's just my strategy for memory work in this hybrid and online environment as compared to what I would do in a face-to-face -face classroom where they would come in and have no notes and, and complete that same kind of activity. Um, so that's one kind of formative assessment thinking. I really like for them to set goals. We've talked about this this summer and we talked about it at One School Health, but I'd like them to take the, uh, the proficiency guidelines, um, the can-do statements is what they are in actual, um, and say, say at the beginning of level two, I can do this and this and this. Now, which of the next three things do I want to try to do this quarter or this semester? And then at the end of the semester, look and see if they've done it and they do all of that work. And then we talk and it cuts down on me. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to give them that feedback. The other um, thing language teachers do is, especially with written and oral work, we try to correct everything. And um, gosh, I've got to find this, I've got to find the name of this fellow, but um, if we think of everything they do in the classroom as intra-language, like that, mm -hmm. the target language negotiating with their knowledge of their um, native language, and so every day they're coming in and whatever they're doing is not fully one or the other. And we're just trying to nudge them along that track to the, the target language. Um, if you correct them all the time, they won't make those connections for themselves. So you have to choose what you mm -hmm. want to correct. Um, and that is anathema to me as a language teacher. I feel like I need to circle every missing accent mark, but, but that doesn't actually help them all that much. Um, Having them do that themselves is more fruitful for them. Having them do their own self-evaluation is more helpful to them in that regard. I love that. And I, what I really appreciate about the way you describe that, Elizabeth, is when we think about, and if you know me at all, you know I love tech. So students don't have to sit with misconceptions if they are waiting for another human being to find every one of those errors, instead the technology and the resources that you build that you said takes time, the intentionality that you put behind that, that then allows them to focus on that cultural connection. What does it mean to communicate in that other language? Mm -hmm. All of those pieces that Google Translate doesn't answer. And it was sort of, we didn't use the word, sorry, I said it, Google Translate. But there's no, so much that it doesn't address. So I think that's very inspirational. I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed talking to you. All right, everyone have a good week and we'll see you next week. <laughs>